Welcome everyone to this uh, presentation on Deferred Tax Simplified. Uh, my name is Neil DaCosta. I'm a um, senior tax tutor at Kaplan and Kaplan offer courses for all kinds of accountancy qualifications such as um, AAT, SEMA, ACCA, ICAW and we also offer lots of tax courses um, including the CTA. So um, what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about deferred tax. So this is something that uh, many people see in financial accounts and they tend to get confused as to what it's all about. So I'm going to simplify deferred tax for you in this short uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to this and I hope you enjoy it. So um, let's start off by looking at what tax is in the financial statements. So when we prepare financial statements, we have um, the profit and loss account, same or the statement of profit and loss account, and we have the balance sheet or uh, the statement of financial position. So um, with regard to the tax expense in uh, in the profit and loss account, the tax expense consists of the current year's corporation tax and the movement in the deferred tax provision. So uh, when you see the tax expense there, you know it actually consists of two things. It's the current year's corp tax and it's the movement in the deferred tax provision. Now with regard to the current uh, corporation tax liability, what would happen is the company would make an estimate as to what they would expect to pay the tax authorities. But the actual amount paid to the tax authorities may be slightly different. And as a result, this creates either an over or an under provision. Okay, so if we have an over or an under provision brought forward from the previous year, if we over provided for tax in the previous year, that over provision will reduce the current year's tax expense, while any under provision would increase the current tax expense. So what then is deferred tax? So what is, what is all this stuff on deferred tax? Well, the idea behind deferred tax is deferred tax arises because there's a difference between taxable profits and accounting profits. So we compute accounting profits for our financial statements. We compute taxable profits for the tax authorities. When computing taxable profits, companies claim tax depreciation called capital allowances okay so when computing um, taxable profits companies claim tax depreciation uh, called capital allowances while when computing accounting profits um, what, what happens then is we compute accounting depreciation now the value of the asset in the accounts is called the carrying value or the net book value so that's simply cost less depreciation. While the asset in our tax computation is referred to as the tax base, and in terms of the tax base, that simply cost less capital allowances. So capital allowances are the tax depreciation the company has claimed. So what we are trying to say is there's a difference between the value of the asset in the financial accounts and the value of the asset in the tax computation. And the difference between the carrying value and the tax base is called a temporary difference. And in terms of the temporary difference, so this is called a temporary difference here, and the deferred tax liability is computed by multiplying that temporary difference by the tax rate. Now, what you must remember is that the deferred tax liability that you're providing is a notional provision. It's not something that will be paid to the tax authorities. So once you set it up, it remains there. It's going to be unchanged. Okay, So it's not like a normal liability you pay to a financial institution or uh, you pay to a supplier, which will be settled by a cash payment. With the deferred tax provision, once it's set up, it's purely a notional liability. And it remains there until you change it. So what we're trying to say here is once the deferred tax provision is established, it's only necessary to compute the difference from one year to the next. 
So let's look at an example on this. So let's say we, we're buying some computer equipment and the computer equipment uh, costs $100,000. The company provides depreciation at a rate of 20% straight line. So each year the depreciation expense will be $20,000. But for capital allowances, so the tax depreciation are 50% uh, in the first year and 25% thereafter. Okay, so with the capital allowances, we get what's called accelerated capital allowances because what the government is trying to do is the government of the country is trying to stimulate commercial investment. And let's say the tax rate is 20% and we're asked to compute the deferred tax liability at the end of year one and year two. So how do we go about doing this? Well. As we said, in year one, the depreciation will be 20,000, 20%. So the carrying value of the asset, or the net book value, is 80,000. Now, in year one, the tax depreciation of the capital allowances are 50,000. Okay, So the tax uh, depreciation um, is 50,000, so the tax base is 50,000. So you can see there we've got this temporary difference between the carrying value and the tax base. So the deferred tax provision at the end of the year one is simply the difference between 80,000 and 50,000. So all we say is 80,000 take away 50,000 is 30,000 and we take that difference and we multiply by the tax rate which is 20%. So that gives us a deferred tax liability of 6,000. So the double entry for establishing that uh, deferred tax liability is we debit the tax expense with 6,000 and we credit the deferred tax liability with 6,000. Now once that's set up, remember that deferred tax provision will remain uh, in, uh, will remain as a non-current liability. So it's not something that you'd actually pay. Now in year two, um, the depreciation is once again 20,000 and uh, the carrying value um, is therefore going to be 60,000. So each year we're claiming the same depreciation of 20% straight line. But in year two, we're now going to claim capital allowances of 25%. So the tax, uh, the tax base of the asset is 50,000. So the capital allowances will be 25% of the 50,000, which is 12,500. So the tax base is therefore 37,500. So to find the deferred tax provision at the end of year one, what we're going to say is 60,000 take away 37,500. So the carrying value less the tax base multiplied by the tax rate. So once again, we've got this temporary difference. And what this means is the deferred tax uh, liability at the end of year two should now be 4,500. So you can see here the temporary difference has reduced. So we should have a smaller deferred tax liability at the end of the second year. So the deferred tax uh, liability we currently have is 6,000 and we need to reduce that down to 4,500. So in order to reduce this, what we do is we debit the deferred tax liability with 1,500 and we credit the tax expense with 1,500. So what would happen here is in the tax expense, we would have the current year's corporation tax liability because we're reducing our deferred tax we are crediting the tax expense with 1500 we're reducing the tax expense by 1500 so the important point as I, I've made uh, to remember about deferred tax is that it's a notional okay or a deemed liability which will never be actually paid so once it's set up it's only necessary to adjust for the movement from one year to the next so I hope that makes it easier for you to understand what we mean by deferred tax. Now, in terms of these uh, temporary differences, apart from the difference between uh, depreciation and capital allowances, we could also have other temporary differences. When we prepare our financial accounts, we prepare them on an accrual basis. So it's based on our invoices. Um, while at times for taxable profits, this is computed based on the cash actually received by the company or paid. 
So this creates another temporary difference because the financial accounts are prepared on an accrual basis, but the taxable profit is computed on a cash basis. Now, we could end up with either a deferred tax asset or we could end up with a deferred tax liability. And what we do is we don't discount these to present values. We simply recognize them on all assets except for goodwill. Now, with regard to property, plant and equipment, we might have a revaluation of this. And while it's important to recognize deferred tax on the revaluation gain as part of our other comprehensive income, Okay. So uh, if we revalue an asset like, like a building, we might have a revaluation gain, and this is disclosed in our uh, statement of profit and loss as other comprehensive income. So uh, let's look at a little example which will help you understand revaluations. So a building has a carrying value of three million, but a tax base of two million. So you can see we already have an existing temporary difference and the asset was revalued up from 3 million to 5 million and the revaluation would be ignored for tax purposes until the asset is sold. So even though we recognize the revaluation for financial statements, we're not going to recognize it for tax purposes. Now the company already has a deferred tax liability of 0.1 million and we're told the tax rate is 20% and what we're trying to do here is compute the deferred tax liability at the end of the year and the adjustment required. So like I said, if you're watching this, what you can then do is pause the video, you know, try and work through it before seeing the solution. Okay. So let's look and see how we're going to deal with this. Well, the deferred tax liability on the temporary difference at the year end will be based on the revalued amount of 5 million. So we're we're increasing the value of the building up to 5 million and that's the figure we're going to compare with the tax base. So we know the tax base is 2 million, so we just work out the difference, 5 take away 2 which is 3, and we multiply 3 million by 20%. And that gives us a deferred tax provision of 0.6 million. Now we already have 0.1 million, okay? So we've already got 0.1 million in the bag, we need that 0.1 million to go up to 0.6 million. So um, we just have to increase it by 0.5 million. Now, in terms of the revaluation gain of 2 million, this would be recorded as other comprehensive income in our financial statements. So what happens is the deferred tax liability on that gain, which is 2 million times 20%, which is 4 million, is also recorded under other comprehensive income. So the idea here is we're matching up the revaluation gain with the deferred tax liability, which relates to that gain. So our first step uh, uh, in, in order to do this is to firstly increase or uplift the deferred tax liability by 0.5 million. So as we said, it, it already is 0.1 million. We need to get it up to 0.6 million. So we increase it up by 0.5 million. So we debit the deferred tax expense with 0.5 million and we credit the deferred tax liability with 0.5 million. So what this means is the deferred tax expense is 0.5 million. But what we now know, need to do is because the revaluation gain is disclosed under other comprehensive income, we need to transfer the tax that relates to this um, revaluation gain into other comprehensive income as well. So our second step is to transfer part of the expense to other comprehensive income to reflect the tax on the revaluation gain. And the way we do this is we debit uh, other comprehensive income with 0.4 million. So that's the deferred tax liability on the revaluation gain. And we credit the deferred tax expense with 0.4 million. So we've taken part of the expense, part of the deferred tax out of the tax expense into other comprehensive income. And this will reduce the deferred tax expense to just 0.1 million. So I've broken it down into a step-by-step -step methodology to help you understand it. Now, 
Um, the other thing that we have to deal with is tax losses, tax losses. So companies don't just make profits, they make a loss. And the company could either have a trading loss or a capital loss. Generally with trading losses, what the tax authorities allow us to do is to carry them forward against the company's future total income. But with capital losses, we can only offset them against future capital gains. Now, it's also possible for these losses to be used by group companies. So we might not just have a single company, we might have a whole series of companies in the same group. So it is possible for the trading losses and the capital losses to be used by group companies. Now, what IS-12 tells us is companies can recognize these losses as deferred tax assets because it's going to save us tax in the future on condition that the company expects probable future gains or profits to occur. So if you're expecting to make uh, future profits or gains, we can recognize these deferred tax assets. So let's look at a little example which will help us understand how to treat these, um, these assets in relation to tax losses. So let's say the company has got 5 million trading losses and it's also got 5 million capital losses. Okay, So we've got 5 million uh, trading losses and we've got 5 million capital losses. Now the company has been making trading losses for the last few years but hopes to become profitable soon. So we've been making trading losses for the last few years, but we hope to become profitable soon. So, you know, we are, we're hopeful that we're going to be profitable, but perhaps we don't really expect uh, that it's likely that we're going to make profits in the near future. Um, in addition to this, the company owns lots of buildings which have appreciated in value and will realize substantial capital gains when we sell them. So the company has a big portfolio of buildings and with regard to these buildings, um, if we sell them, they're going to give us capital gains. The directors have already put, in, put plans uh, in action to sell some of the buildings in order to make uh, the company's cash flow position and liquidity much more favorable. So they've already put plans in action. So what we can see is with regard to the capital gains, um, because the company has put plans in action, these capital gains are likely to take place in the near future. So um, in terms of the expectation of future profits, this is low based on the fact that the company has been making trading losses for the last few years. So. As far as um, IS-12 is concerned, the company should not recognize the trading losses as deferred tax assets. Because we don't expect, we don't expect to make uh, trading profits to use up those uh, trading losses in the near future. However, with regard to the capital gains, the company does expect to realize substantial capital gains on the buildings because our portfolio of buildings have appreciated in value and we are planning on selling them. So the directors have already put plans in action to sell some of these buildings. So we are expecting uh, to make uh, substantial capital gains in the near future. So we can recognize the capital losses of 5 billion as a deferred asset, but we can't recognize the trading losses of 5 million as a deferred asset. So I hope that helps you understand um, how to treat um, losses in terms of deferred assets. So if you have a likelihood that you're um, going to have profits um, against which to use up the trading losses, you can recognize the trading losses um, as an asset. So if the company is profitable, by all means recognize the trading losses as an asset. Um, and if you're going to make capital gains, you can recognize the capital losses as an asset as well. 
Now, what about consolidation? So we know groups of companies have to prepare consolidated financial statements. So each company within the group would have its individual set of accounts, but to reflect the fact that the group is a single entity, what we do is we consolidate or we bring the accounts of all the different companies together in the same group. So we need to make a subsidiary adjustments, uh, currency elimination, we need to eliminate things like intra-group balances and so on. So when we consolidate financial statements, we make fair value adjustments and we adjust the values of assets to market values. But these fair value adjustments are ignored in computing the tax base, leading to a temporary difference and a corresponding deferred tax liability. So we make fair value adjustments for our financial accounts, but they do not affect our tax base. So we're going to have a temporary difference in relation to fair value adjustments. Another consolidation adjustment that's required is the provision for unrealized profit on inventory sold between group companies. So let's say one group company sells uh, inventory to another group company and makes a profit of $100,000. Because the group company still owns that inventory at the end of the reporting period, we've not realized that 100000 profit yet. We haven't sold it to a customer. So what we need to do is we provide for this unrealized profits. Um, so these would be reflected in the financial statements, but are ignored uh, in computing the tax base. So once again, we've got this temporary difference and would end up with a corresponding deferred tax asset. So remember, with regard to consolidations, you would also have things like fair value adjustments or provisions for unrealized profits. And these would also create temporary difference. So by now, I've given you a good uh, foundation on um, deferred tax, and I hope all of you um, will find this useful when you interpret financial statements. Um, if, um, if you're interested in having more essential technical knowledge, I've uh, written a book called Advanced Tax Condensed, and it has everything um, for advanced tax in about 150 full color pages with multiple images and Neil's top tips and it's available on my website neildacosta.co.uk if you've enjoyed this presentation please connect with me on social media like LinkedIn because I post lots of useful tax updates um, uh, tax interpretations and so on uh, which many many people find very useful it's been a pleasure meeting you today and uh, I hope at Kaplan we can assist you um, in the future all the best